This video is going to give a um, overview of the blood cells that are found in humans, and then go to the vertebrate condition and talk about the evolution of blood cells. Uh, so um, blood is obviously very important. It serves a number of functions. First, it has to transport materials throughout a body, because once you get a big body, um, then there are things which occur, for example, in humans in the lungs, the gas exchange, uh, which then affect the rest of the body. And so you have to get carbon dioxide to the uh, lungs, you have to get oxygen from the lungs to other tissues. Um, there are things that happen in the small intestine which affect the rest of the body. The nutrients absorbed here uh, must be transported. Wastes are re released from the kidneys. Hormones are released from various uh, glands. Lactic acid has to be returned to the liver. And so therefore transport becomes very important. Uh, the blood in general can perform other uh, roles as well. Uh, it can help to regulate the environment of specialized cells, uh, keeping their, um, uh, uh, their pH and ion concentrations uh, the same, and it can protect the body from infection, from the loss of fluid, etc. Um, there are different components of blood. So if you were to spin blood down or centrifuge it, uh, one finds that one gets a couple of layers. Uh, most of it is water, and the water plus the proteins which are dissolved in it, we refer to as plasma. But then there are different what we call formed elements of the blood. We'd like to call them cells, but in humans, um, platelets technically aren't cells. So formed elements, perhaps uh, the more correct term. Um, uh, much of the blood, you know, give or take 45% uh, percent of it, uh, is uh, the heavier part which sinks, uh, the uh, red blood cells, which form a hematocrit layer. And then there are also white blood cells and, um, and uh, platelets, uh, which uh, uh, form a buffy coat uh, in between the plasma and the red blood cell layer. Um, now, these cells are made in the bone marrow. Uh, which is a very specialized area. Um, when we are fetuses, uh, blood cells can be made a number of places, starting in the yolk sac, then the liver. Um, but then as we approach birth, it's uh, limited only to the skeletal system. At first, all bones can produce uh, blood cells, um, but then uh, it is uh, narrowed to only certain uh, bones in uh, the adult. And so we have red bone marrow, where uh, blood cells are main, and the remaining bone marrow uh, is yellow bone marrow where adipose can be stored. As you can see here, if we're simulating um, x-ray uh, vision, uh, one can see that uh, the red bone marrow occurs in the skeletal system, but not in all bones. Only in certain bones uh, does uh, blood uh, continue uh, to uh, be made. Now, um, this bone marrow is special because when we're a fetus, uh, we, have a lot of, uh, we have a large number of stem cells which haven't decided who they'd like to be when they grow up. And um, then they differentiate, they specialize to choose a special cell fate. In the adult body, there's less of that. But we continually need new blood cells. Every single second, we are making millions of red blood cells and millions of white blood cells. And so we need a specialization. We need cells to differentiate, to make the red blood cells, white blood cells, et cetera, that we need. And this occurs in the uh, red uh, bone marrow. Here we see yellow bone marrow, and you see the big cells of adipose. Um, that's uh, a difference. So this is a yellow bone marrow. The, red, uh, the new blood cells are only made in the, um, in the red bone marrow. And so looking at bone marrow, what you see are cells which are differentiating, choosing a cell fate. And once again, that's kind of exciting in the adult body because that doesn't happen as much as it did in, um, uh, in the fetus. Uh, from this bone marrow uh, comes the three types of formed elements in humans. Let's start with the red blood cells. Um, red blood cells compose more than 99% of all formed elements. So for example, there's a white blood cell, there's a white blood cell, and there's a couple smudges of platelets here, but everything else is a red blood cell. Uh, and so they are the most abundant cells in blood. And they're also one of the most abundant cells in the body. They're small. And since you have a lot of blood, I've seen estimates of maybe one in every four cells of your body is a red blood cell, um, about 25 trillion of the 100 trillion overall. So that's a huge number of 
uh, cells uh, which uh, are uh, red uh, blood uh, cells. Now, in humans being mammals, and we'll see how this is different from the ancestral condition, um, uh, they are what is known as a biconcave. All right, so here you can see they have a concave surface, a depression on this side, and then when they flip to the other side, they are biconcave as well. So they are small cells, which instead of being nice and spherical, uh, they have a biconcave surface. Uh, now, this has the advantage of it gives them a greater surface area for gas exchange. And so that's the primary job of a red blood cell. Uh, to transport gases like uh, oxygen and to a lesser extent carbon dioxide. And with a greater surface area, these small cells can exchange gases more uh, efficiently. Uh, the way that um, the red blood cells have achieved this shape is uh, while they were maturing in the bone marrow, they ejected their nucleus. Now, not only does that increase the surface area, um, but it also makes them a bit more flexible. And flexibility is important, uh, especially in mammals where uh, the blood vessels tend to be a bit uh, narrower than what we might find, say, in a reptile. Um, in mammals, red blood cells also eject their mitochondria. These are the cell's second largest organelles. Uh, mitochondria are the part of the cell which use oxygen. So obviously a red blood cell, if it's supposed to transport oxygen, would be less efficient if it could simultaneously use oxygen. And so um, uh, red blood cells not only eject uh, their nucleus, but other organelles as well, including the um, and the mitochondria. So it is in the bone marrow that a hormone stimulates the stem cells, the precursors. Uh, this hormone is um, uh, erythropoietin, which comes from the kidney. And this then signals the cell, which hasn't decided who it would like to be when it grows up, to grow up to be a red blood cell. And part of that process is to eject its nucleus and mitochondria and develop that biconcave shape. Um, but another part of the uh, a process is to make hemoglobin. Now, most I mean, cells of the body, I mean, they have protein, so that's not special, but um, a typical cell has a lot of different kinds of protein, but not so much of any one kind. Uh, red blood cells are an exception. They don't have that many kinds of proteins. And one protein, hemoglobin, um, makes up, you know, a huge percent of uh, the cell, you know, a quarter of uh, the cell, give or take, with you know, 25 million molecules of hemoglobin per cell. Now, when I refer to hemoglobin, what I mean is that um, this uh, protein is made by taking smaller subunits and putting them together. So the cells while in the bone marrow make two alpha chains and two beta chains, and then together that is what we refer to as hemoglobin. It's called hemoglobin, because the protein part in red is called uh, globin. And then these uh, green circles with the darker center, that is a heme unit that binds an iron atom. And this, uh, this is the part which can bind oxygen. Carbon dioxide can bind the globin part in red. Now, when I say it binds oxygen, and technically that's not that exciting. Lots of things can bind oxygen. The thing about red blood cells is that um, they can bind oxygen reversibly and that they can bind oxygen and then they can let it go. So red blood cells can travel to the lungs, grab oxygen, and then go to a tissue like the brain or a muscle and then let it go. And so those oxygen molecules bind to um, uh, uh, to the iron atom in the middle of a heme. Now, if each hemoglobin molecule has four hemes, and if each red blood cell has on average 250 million molecules of hemoglobin, that means that a red blood cell, each and every one, can bind a billion molecules of oxygen gas. So that is an incredible uh, ability uh, of red blood cells uh, to transport oxygen. So red blood cells are certainly important then in human blood, um, but not just in uh, human blood. And so if we were then to consider the, um, uh, the blood of other vertebrates such as fish, I'm sorry, come on. 
So here you see a shark swimming. Um, the shark is swimming using muscles, but muscles, they need a great deal of ATP energy in order to do this. So they need a lot of oxygen. So a fish wouldn't be able to swim like this unless it was able to efficiently deliver oxygen to its tissues. Now, oxygen does dissolve in water like blood plasma, but not a lot. Blood plasma is polar being most of, um, uh, being uh, made mostly of uh, water, whereas um, uh, oxygen is nonpolar. And so here, when you look at fish blood, look at all of the red blood cells, all right? So just as uh, most of human blood is composed of red blood cells, the same is true of fish blood. And fish blood then contains uh, these molecules of uh, hemoglobin. You can see the, uh, the pigmentation uh, there, uh, uh, which uh, gives them uh, that darker uh, color. Now, you'll probably notice that uh, in the fish blood, in the frog blood, in the turtle blood, red blood cells have nuclei. So that is a big difference between the red blood cells of mammals and non-mammal uh, uh, vertebrates, uh, where uh, when we look at the um, uh, when we look at the fish, uh, the um, I, I'm sorry, when we look at the um, non-mammals, uh, uh, you'll see uh, these prominent nuclei. It was part of uh, the adaptation of mammals, uh, which ejected these uh, nuclei prior to being uh, present in circulation. Now, this could have been a gradual process in that some reptile red blood cells eject their nuclei, a small percentage. And then when we look at um, uh, mammals like uh, marsupials, um, uh, you can see that uh, they can retain nuclei to a greater uh, degree. So it doesn't have to be an all uh, or a nothing scenario. In fact, a small percentage of human red blood cells still have their uh, nuclei and eject them uh, even after they enter circulation. When we mammals were embryos, uh, the liver made red blood cells and uh, note that um, uh, red blood cells uh, from a mammalian fetus still have prominent red blood cell, uh, still have prominent nuclei, just like we would uh, associate with that of say a, a reptile uh, or a fish. Here is a human um, a blood smear and notice that here is an exceptional red blood cell that still has retained its uh, nucleus. And, and so uh, the ancestral condition of red blood cells uh, was uh, to have uh, a, a nucleus. Um, but these go back uh, to the fish um, because uh, if you don't put your hemoglobin inside cells, uh, uh, when uh, blood was then filtered at the kidneys, you would lose uh, protein and, and hemoglobin potentially. And so you need to keep this hemoglobin uh, inside um, uh, inside uh, cells, um, and so uh, uh, so here we can see uh, some of these um, uh, changes over uh, time. Um, now, uh, uh, hemoglobin and uh, red blood cells continued uh, to uh, evolve um, because uh, one of the things uh, which uh, the um, uh, the jawed vertebrates uh, would get would be the ability uh, to, uh, after making the enzyme car uh, and uh, carbonic anhydrase in red blood cells, uh, to convert carbon dioxide into bicarbonate. And this uh, then is the form in which most carbon dioxide travels uh, through uh, the blood. Uh, the jawless uh, fish uh, cannot uh, do that. And so, uh, once again, you know, there were changes in. Uh, these um, red blood cells over time. And then the same can be uh, said of hemoglobin. So a red blood cell, you know, to a large extent, is a bag of hemoglobin. Um, but hemoglobin uh, certainly changed uh, over uh, time. Uh, when life started, there wasn't much oxygen in the air, but that changed about 2 billion uh, years ago. Uh, and then organisms needed a way of dealing with um, uh, of dealing with oxygen. Um, bacteria actually uh, evolved uh, the first globin uh, molecules, uh, which have 
uh, homologies uh, to the hemoglobin which uh, the vertebrates uh, use. And so uh, there are a lot of globins uh, present in uh, bacteria. And they can actually do things other than transport uh, oxygen. So they can board, uh, bind nitric oxide or bind hydrogen sulfide, et cetera. Um, plants uh, have uh, globins, which they can express in their roots. And so globins are actually old molecules, which long predate the mammals. Um, one of the things that we, we see when we study genes is that gene duplications often take one gene and then make multiple copies uh, of them. And so uh, by the time we get uh, to uh, vertebrates, there are multiple copies of uh, the uh, globins, uh, including one which is the homolog of myoglobin or hemoglobin. Uh, that later duplicates to produce myoglobin, which is present in muscle, and hemoglobin, which is expressed in red blood cells. And then uh, duplications after that make a number of different globins, alpha globins, beta globins, and others. There's an alpha gene family, a beta gene family. Uh, but I'm just uh, making the point that uh, even if you have globins and hemoglobin in red blood cells, they could actually differ as you compare one organism to another. So for example, we have a set of genes um, uh, on chromosome 11, which is the gene family of beta globin. And here's an eta gene in the gene family. So we use as adults, beta and delta. We can use other um, family members as a fetus, but eta, when humans are embryos, we don't use. Um, but hoofed animals like cows or goats, they would. And so uh, these globins duplicated over time. And uh, the specific proteins and the roles that each have in uh, different uh, cells uh, can, uh, can vary. Okay, um, so those are the red blood cells. Uh, when we look at human blood, can we see white blood cells? Uh, we can. Um, but they are not the uh, dominant uh, types of, um, of blood cells. So there are the red blood cells or the erythrocytes, and then there are a number of white um, uh, blood cells or uh, leukocytes. Now, one of the, the things which I know is hard to you know, imagine at first is the majority of white uh, blood cells um, leave the blood and then go to other tissues, like the tissues of the lymphatic system. And so I want to say a few words about white blood cells now, um, but this really isn't the place to describe them in depth. The majority of white blood cells are not in the blood. They are in the lymphatic tissues. And so therefore it is in you know, the lymphatic system that we should best you know, describe these white blood cells. Um, if you remember, there was a video a minute ago that had, I said, red blood cell, red blood cell. Oh, look, there's a white blood cell. So out of, you know, in this sea of red blood cells, there was a single you know, one or two white blood cells. Um, but if you were to look at immune tissues like the thymus or a lymph node or the white pulp of the spleen uh, or a tonsil or the appendix, you would see something like this. You would just see white blood cells everywhere. So once again, white blood cells are not primarily in the blood, they are in other tissues. So they're worth mentioning here, um, but certainly not um, the comprehensive explanation of white blood cells. That's more appropriate uh, in the discussion of the immune system. Now, white blood cells, um, in contrast to the red blood cells, which transport gases as their main job, white blood cells uh, provide immunity, protection from invaders. Now, there are different types of threats to your body. Right, so your body is threatened by, well, certain bacteria which can cause diseases, but then there are viruses, and then there are protists, you know, larger cells which can cause things like, you know, malaria um, and other uh, diseases. But then there are parasitic worms. There are ectoparasites on the outside of us like ticks or fleas. Um, uh, there are uh, cancer cells, there are toxins, there are all these different types of threats. And so therefore we have different types of white uh, blood cells uh, which protect us against uh, these uh, threats. Some of them, when we stain them, have prominent granules. These are specialized lysosomes, uh, lysosomes I'm sorry. Um, and uh, we call these 
three kinds in humans, the granulocytes, because when we stain them, you can see these small granules. There are neutrophils. Uh, these uh, stain a light purple with their granules, and their nucleus tends to break into a large number of lobes. These are especially good at fighting bacteria and things that have bound antibodies. There are eosinophils, uh, so named because they take up the red stain eosin. Uh, they uh, have larger granules that take up that red stain, and they are very good at fighting parasitic worms. Uh, there are basophils, which have very large granules, which take up a dark uh, uh, purple basic stain. And uh, they have so many granules that it tends to obscure the nucleus. You don't get a good look at the nucleus because of the, uh, the granules. They are very good at uh, promoting inflammation. These are all granulocytes because you see granules in them. Um, there are also then two kinds uh, called agranulocytes because you don't see granules uh, staining in them. You see very large cells called monocytes uh, that have a kidney-shaped nucleus. And then you see small cells which are mostly nucleus, nucleus with a little bit of cytoplasm around them. These are the lymphocytes. And the lymphocytes are extremely complex. They are the ones that make antibodies and are responsible for adaptive immunity, that immunity that changes over time and lets the vertebrates live so long because they're so good at fighting off um, infections. Uh, uh, white blood cells are different from red blood cells. Red blood cells, no offense, they aren't very smart. They just go where they're pushed. They go with the current in the blood. Whereas white blood cells are constantly looking for chemical signals. And if they see chemical signals like inflammatory signals, they then can squeeze out um, between uh, the endothelial cells which line blood vessels and go to the uh, peripheral uh, tissues. Once there, they can eat microbes, they can promote inflammation, some can cause a fever, which is uh, helpful in our um, responses to uh, uh, infection. And so uh, white blood cells or leukocytes uh, have the very important uh, role of uh, protecting us uh, from uh, infection. Uh, once again, those are the kinds of white blood cells which we see in uh, in humans, um, but we also see uh, white blood cells in other uh, vertebrates. And so um, cells which move like amoeba, all right, and eat bacteria, well, they go back to, well, quite frankly, amoeba, right? So amoeba are protists, which are, you know, protists date back 2 billion years. And so um, the, uh, our white blood cells, which can squeeze through uh, the blood vessel lining as they move like an amoeba, and they can, you know, perform phagocytosis of, you know, bacteria which are threatening our body. Um, this is, you know, an ability which we see in, um, uh, in uh, protists, and actually they are present in all animals, even sponges, which are so simple that they lack tissues. Here in this sponge, uh, it has these yellowish cells here, which move in an amoeboid fashion and can perform phagocytosis of microbes, which among other things can help protect the, uh, the sponge overall from infection. Um, and so uh, this you know, is an old ability. And organisms a long time ago realized that you know, there are lots of potential threats. There are lots of different kinds of bacteria of infectious uh, protists. Uh, there are microscopic worms uh, which can cause infections. There are fungi and uh, the like. And so by the time of vertebrates, not only are there cells which protect against infection, um, but different kinds of white blood cell to specialize in different, kind, uh, different kinds of infectious agents. Um, and so uh, as you look at these uh, cells, uh, which you'll see in a minute in a fish, uh, these are white blood cells, and you'll see differences between them. Some of them have granules that contain, you know, various uh, chemicals which help uh, them destroy, uh, you know, infecting uh, bacteria and, um, and the like. Now, what I would love to say is I would love to say, look, here's a neutrophil, here's an eosinophil, since we always already know those terms in uh, in humans. The problem is, however, um, when we look at fish, 
Um, certainly cells can have some of the features of neutrophils. So for example, they can have different lobes in their nucleus. They can make some of the enzymes that one would say find in a neutrophil. But there then again are differences. So there are similarities, but there are differences. And so, you know, do we really feel comfortable, you know, saying, using the exact same word for this cell in fish, you know, because it isn't the exactly the same. So typically text will use the term heterophil um, for um, some uh, white uh, blood cells. Um, notice that some can have granules, right? Some can cause inflammation. Uh, and so fish, have cells which have similarities to, um, uh, to neutrophils, uh, to uh, inflammatory uh, promoting uh, cells like uh, basophils and uh, the like. And obviously a very important cell type to discuss are the lymphocytes since lymphocytes are responsible for that adaptive immunity. Certainly the precursors to lymphocytes date back even before the vertebrates in that um, some primitive chordates known as urochordates can have what are called NK cells. They are almost lymphocytes. So the fact that you can find almost lymphocytes in things which aren't even vertebrates, that's uh, significant. Um, uh, the jawless fish, they don't have true um, lymphocytes, um, but they do have almost lymphocytes. So we can argue, once again, they're not lymphocytes. Um, certainly uh, uh, the jawless fish don't have a thymus where T lymphocytes would need to mature, but nevertheless, they do have white blood cells which have some lymphocyte features. So it seems that lymphocytes developed in stages where the chordates had almost lymphocytes, those NK cells. The um, jawless fish had, while they don't perhaps have true lymphocytes, they have cells with, uh, with many of the features of uh, lymphocytes. Uh, the jawed fishes all have lymphocytes, all have the ability to make antibodies. And so thus, when we look at the blood of jawed fishes or uh, of jawed vertebrates, such as the frog and the turtle in this, um, uh, in, uh, this uh, video, uh, we will uh, then see uh, diverse uh, white uh, blood cells. Um, uh, here you notice the different lobes in uh, the nucleus. You can see granules in some, the absence of granules in others. Uh, what, you know, once you get the jawed vertebrates, you do have true lymphocytes. And so uh, the white bloods uh, here, you can notice something that looks like a basophil. It has so many uh, granules uh, that it obscures uh, the uh, nucleus just as you know, uh, the granules in, uh, this looks like a monocyte with its kidney shaped uh, uh, nucleus. And so um, there are diverse types of threatening infe infectious organisms. And just as humans have diverse types of white blood cells uh, to protect the body from these diverse threats, we see the same in fish, we see the same in frogs, we see the same in uh, turtles. And there are similarities between the white blood cells of mammals and humans uh, versus uh, these, um, uh, these uh, other uh, organisms uh, here. Okay. So those are white uh, blood uh, cells. Um, next, I'd like uh, to say a word about uh, platelets and blood clotting. Uh, but this is there's a bit of a twist when we compare what humans have compared uh, to what other uh, vertebrates uh, would have. So platelets aren't actual uh, cells. Uh, platelets instead, uh, they uh, are pieces of large cells from the uh, bone marrow. And so in the bone marrow, there are cells called megakaryocytes or metamegakaryocytes. And when uh, a bone marrow cell is stimulated with the hormone thrombopoietin, it gets really big and breaks into lots of little pieces. Each one of these pieces is a platelet. So a platelet isn't a true blood cell. Um, uh, each one is just a piece of a blood cell. And platelets' main roles are to promote the clotting of blood. Now, clotting is essential because we are mostly fluid. There's more water in us than anything else. And then if we were to develop a cut, if we essentially sprung a leak, since there's more water in us than anything else, eventually we could lose so much fluid that we would 
lose blood pressure and thus lose the ability to deliver oxygen to the brain. We mammals would lose the ability to regulate our temperatures um, and, and that you know, we could die even from a small cut. And so um, what platelets help to do is to clot uh, blood uh, to um, convert a protein which is already in the blood fibrinogen into a longer uh, version known as fibrin, which then forms a clot. And so here you can see some of my blood and you know, over time, uh, then uh, you see this uh, protein of the fibrin uh, uh, clot uh, uh, forming. Um, now, how this happens is actually complicated and you know, uh, not something that uh, I'm going to go into all of the detail uh, now, although you know, I have videos that do this. Um, it's, it's what's called a cascade. So in this cascade, it's not as if you know, uh, we need to you know, plug, uh, or plug a, uh, a cut blood vessel and all of a sudden this protein goes from one phase to another and, and then you know, the, uh, uh, the cut is uh, plugged. Uh, so instead we see a cascade where there's one protein which stimulates another one, which stimulates another one, which stimulates uh, another one. And it's at the end of this process that uh, the clot then is formed. And we then even see alternate ways of starting it. So you can start the process this way, using these clotting factors, you can start the process uh, this way, and then go uh, and you know perform the final steps. Uh, and at the end of the final steps, we start taking that fibrinogen, which is already present in the blood, and converting into these long chains of, um, uh, of fibrin. Uh, so that's what platelets do. Um, the history of this is a bit more uh, complicated um, because platelets only exist in mammals, right? So uh, non-mammals do not have platelets. Uh, they have cells that look like white blood cells, which are called thrombocytes. And so non-mammals have a big nucleated cell called a thrombocyte. And you can often identify them because uh, as you'll see, they are elongated. And so uh, these elongated cells, uh, they are the ones uh, which uh, start the uh, clotting uh, cascade in fish, in frogs, in turtles, uh, et cetera. Um, they use many of the same clotting factors, but not all. And so here's then the difficulty, uh, because when one says, you know, you know, humans have 12 clotting factors plus other proteins which are uh, involved, um, do they, uh, you know, exist in other organisms? Yes, to varying degrees. So fish don't have as many as frogs do. Frogs don't have as many human proteins as reptiles do, uh, et cetera. Um, but then fish may have you know, different ones. And, and uh, certainly it isn't completely studied how uh, fish blood clots and all of the roles of these. And so this clotting factor cascade, um, it uh, exists uh, in uh, other uh, vertebrates, um, but it can exist to different forms. And there are simpler cascades which don't have as many, um, as many pieces in it. And so uh, we certainly see uh, similarities between these human platelets, and that's what you're looking at now, these little purple smudges, which aren't big cells with nuclei. Um, that's different from the thrombocytes, the big cells which we see in uh, the other uh, vertebrates. Um, uh, but nevertheless, uh, some aspects of the clotting factor cascades uh, date uh, back to earlier vertebrates and you know, were just modified over uh, time. So that was just a quick introduction into the red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets in humans and what they do. And then also you know, some consideration of the, ancestor, uh, the evolution of the various types of blood cells uh, in vertebrates.